let me work it out and then I'll figure out which side I fall on. Well, I'll tell you about that. I I tell brethren ask things about different questions and about different people. And even Brother Haley, Homer Haley, they question me about what he believes about something. And here's my response. I'm going to have to think long and hard before, before I, okay, I must think long and hard before I contradict some of these guys. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Gary wasn't right about everything. Yeah, he, he wasn't right about everything. There, they went to that conference. They, he goes to every year. He teaches at Carol Lee and the Biologo Science Institute. Francis Collins is the On the hill to the road. I'm not a <laughs> Just say that. Go back here and meet these guys. I know this is Julie wouldn't get out of the way for you, but she got out of the way for your mom and daddy. Hi there, I'm Mike Nackamore. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Brianna. Where y'all from? All right. Well, we're glad you showed up. Good to have you tonight, both of you. Do you know there is a green hill? We're going to sing that at the end of my class. So, make it time. Oh. 
playing in Washington, is he? I talked to him all ago. Bless his heart. Is he going to be here tonight? Okay, so he's uh, late. <clears throat> it's time to start. Appreciate you uh, being here tonight. If you came here for Hill Roberts class, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm the uh, younger, skinnier version. I'm I'm short and fat, but I'm not quite as fat, uh, maybe, a little shorter than Hill. Uh, he, he did what I do, uh, start a class one week and then leave town and then come back. But he told me I could do anything I wanted to do, and I have thought, I've known for a few weeks this was going to happen, and so I've spent a little time thinking about it, and I didn't want to depart entirely from what uh, from, from his theme, and so I have chosen uh, very generally uh, uh, the subject matter tonight, and I hope that it'll be helpful to you. That's what I hope. We do have guests, and we're grateful that you're here. About half of our group's gone. I have no idea where part of them are, but uh, part of them in North Carolina, there are others who are sick, and uh, we are uh, quite uh, short tonight uh, from what we might normally be. Let's, uh, let me mention, I guess, a couple of things I should mention. Uh, Lynn uh, Franklin had some tests last, I believe, last Friday, or was it Friday? And he's going to have some more on Thursday. So please, that's, is that tomorrow, Lynn? next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, so uh, please remember uh, Lynn in prayer, uh, if you would. The report that came out this afternoon about Ron is, uh, is actually, I think, an encouraging report. They've been waiting to do a CT scan. Uh, his kidney function needed to improve enough that he could have the dye that would be necessary to get the contrast for the CT scan, and so he reached that number, and they did the scan uh, yesterday. And he got the results today. They're going to do a procedure to deal with this pseudo aneurysm. I don't know exactly what that is. You can see Mel after. He'll explain it. And uh, they're going to fix that. He's going to be in the hospital about another week. And then, um, and then he uh, will have his choice probably of rehab, where he's going to be for a little while. So let's, uh, let's remember, Ron, he is much more alert. He's eating on his own. There are just a lot of things he's doing that are positive. Spends a lot of time asleep. So if you go there and he's asleep, don't, don't feel bad. He woke up for my arrival, slept while I was there, and then woke up for my departure. Uh, so that was, uh, that was fine. So he, he, he got to skip out on a whole lot of nonsense. Uh, we have others I know in our family who uh, are in need of our prayers. Good to see uh, Peggy Shelton here tonight. She's a little better, she said. We're glad she's here. All right, let's pray together. Our great God, we're thankful for this day, for the beauty of it, for the opportunities that were presented in the course of it, and we pray that as we use those opportunities that your name was glorified in it. We ask you, Father, to forgive us of our sins. We pray that uh, the petition of our hearts would come before you and you would hear us on behalf of those that we have mentioned and others who need you desperately in, the, in, in their health circumstances. We thank you for the, the improvement of, uh, of our brother Ron. We are grateful for the tests and the medical technologies that will allow brother Franklin to find out why he's been feeling ill lately. And we ask you, Father, especially for those who are going through treatments of various kinds, uh, Sylvia Henderson's sister, most especially, and Sierra Elledge. Uh, we pray that you would watch over and uh, be with Jack Taft, as we've mentioned uh, him. We ask you to be with each one of these in their treatment. We pray that the efforts that we make here tonight will be pleasing to you. We pray that we'll be lifted up in the Lord, that we'll be strengthened to look beyond the minutiae of uh, 
uh, concerns of daily affairs and to see what you are do truly doing in the course of our lives, in the course of uh, your handling and dealing with humanity. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many of us uh, have used the uh, phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees? That's an old phrase. It was a little bit different originally in the Old English. Uh, it was first used in uh, some writing from 1546 in England. It was adopted and applied to um, a group of houses. I'm not sure, probably row houses of some sort that were uh, built uh, in the 1700s by an architect by the name of John Wood. And uh, John Haywood's phrase from his uh, English proverb, uh, you can't see the wood for the tree, uh, was actually used to talk about this architectural issue that many uh, had with Mr. Wood's, um, with Mr. Wood's plan. And, and you can decide about whether or not that's an accurate representation of where this little idiom comes from, but we've all used it. You can't see the forest for the trees. And what that really intends is that you focus on something that's kind of big right in front of you, and you miss the beauty that is behind it. And, and I want to borrow from that phrase tonight, and in connection with what Hill is doing in his class is he gives us the big picture Bible story of what God is doing. And I want to talk to you about some of those things that distract us from God's big picture. And I, as I thought about and prepared the material I was going to talk about tonight, I really didn't so much think of issues or circumstances that I have faced in the last 15 years that I've worked here with this congregation, but this is something I've observed. Uh, largely among our brethren, uh, and not even specifically necessarily in the local churches where I've been. You see it here and there a little bit, maybe in one individual or another, but it's, it's not a prevailing sort of problem, I think, at least it hadn't been in the local churches where I've worked, but I've seen it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you're very well connected with brethren around the country, you'll see it fairly evidently. Uh, on your Facebook feed or on one of your social media feeds all the time. You'll see it almost every day. Uh, you'll have this hobby or that hobby. You'll have this discussion or that discussion. You'll have this issue or that issue. And people are so, are so focused on those. And, and it's, not, it's not that those are not important issues. It's that one of the things that happens to us as Christians is we become distracted by the things that are right in front of us and we fail to appreciate what God is really doing as he interacts with humankind, as he interacts with mankind and interacts with his people around the world. And so tonight I will talk to you about some of those things. And I think you'll recognize them. And, and maybe, maybe I could, could do it this way. Before I give you my list, maybe I could ask for your list. Uh, what do you think are some things that we can become so focused on right in front of us, religiously speaking, that will distract us from God's redemptive plan of salvation? What are some things, questions that will come up? Let me, let me give you a hint. How about the area of human concern with which God has not dealt? The unrevealed things, the things God hasn't talked about. Do you find yourself spending a lot of time thinking about or looking into or wondering about or being concerned with things that God has not revealed? I tease the Jim says no. He doesn't spend any mental time on that. All right. The Bible is not a document of extraneous information. It's not. All right, and I appreciate that. That's the world I live in. Hill made reference to it rather briefly Sunday, this phrase I uh, borrowed from a, a fairly famous Texas preacher uh, where he used to talk about this when he 
and he described it as whittling on God's end of the stick. That's not our business. That's, that's his business, the unrevealed. But you know what? Jim, you're not on Facebook, are you? Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, well, good, good for you. My mother used to believe it was a government conspiracy. That's what she believed. And then she had all these grandchildren, and she got on there anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, so the unrevealed. That's an area that I see a lot of conversation about. And, and I hear it from time to time among God's people. Anybody have something you want to put on the list that you could think of? Let me give you another one real quick. How about the traditions of men? Human traditions. How many songs are authorized in a first uh, a Sunday morning assembly, Sarah? <laughs> Two. How many you have before the prayer? See what I'm getting at? Ladies and gentlemen, I have heard arguments over those kinds of questions. Whether you close with a song or close with a prayer, and the song leader forgets, you know... Everything should be done decently in order. I understand that. And, and I understand the motives. But sometimes, because Uncle Johnny did it, Uncle Johnny from my mother's side, third removed, you know, um, did it this way, and therefore we should do it that way. Now, I could give you more serious traditions of men, but that's the silly illustration. I see a lot of conversation about that. A lot of people are consumed with that, well, you know, it just doesn't look very good. We have a beautiful electronic sign here in front of the building. It's very useful to us in communicating with passers-by. Did you know we have over 14,000 people a day that pass in front of our building? Did you know that? Or at least passers-by. Some of them are multiple occasions for us to interact with them. A number of years ago, the church where I used to be a long time ago, was going to do that they were going to have one and we had a similar sort of situation we had that many people even more than that passing in front of the building and the elders received a letter uh, from one of the members they didn't have the courage to step up and address it in person they wrote a letter and in the letter they said that that looks liberal that looks liberal well, that's what i'm talking about this is a human assumption decision about it uh, and that therefore uh, and you know what to this day they don't have one and it's too bad how about much study to no profit running down this rabbit trail that rabbit trail have you ever sat through a sermon that was a that was a concordance sermon do you know what i mean by that preacher makes a point and then he runs down every verse in the concordance that uses that word uh, it's, it's much study is a weariness to the flesh, isn't it? Not, not diminishing the need for study, but studying questions like the left wing uh, flight or the, the flight patterns of left wing angels just really doesn't accomplish very much, does it? How about strife about words to no profit? The meaning of word. My grandfather gave me some advice a long time ago about Greek words. I'm not a Greek scholar. I have all of the books, all the research material. It's a wonderful exercise to look into the meaning of words. But you know what those words mean? If you're looking, there's 10 meanings, potential meanings of a word. You know which one is the one that, is defi that defines the word properly? The way the people on the street, the common man on the street understood the word. That's a very simple, superficial sort of explanation. But that will solve a lot of our problems. Strife about words to no profit. About carnality, the influence of the world in our life. That prevents us from seeing the big picture, doesn't it? When, when, when prevailing culture runs up against clear-cut commands of God and, and it becomes hard to teach or to accept or to proclaim, however you like to describe it. You see, you see where we're going? It shows up a little better back here doesn't it, than it does in the back. Foolish questions. One of the things I learned very, very early in teaching auditory and Bible classes was to not entertain hypothetical questions. 
hypothetical, well, what if? And what if that? Or what if the other? Uh, foolish questions uh, can, can really prevent someone from seeing the, the meaning of, of what God is actually communicating. Our arrogance. I have it all figured out already. I know. And, and therefore, I cannot be taught on this. So, well, brother, I mean, let's look at this. Oh, I, you can't teach me that. You're too young. I've been told that before. I'm not being told that anymore somehow. I don't know. Vainglory. Um, this is our vanity showing through. And to some degree, it's akin to this idea of arrogance that somehow um, my view or my place is more important really than than something or other and then there's just out and out ignorance <laughs> yeah. it, it is it is and I've been asked that question a hundred times in, in my life, and um, I was asked it in Houston. Uh, Y'all have heard my Diane Johnson story of the young woman who died before I could baptize her. And it's a tragic story. And this guy tell, asked me this question. I'd driven 50 miles to have a Bible study with this guy. and he, we going through the, the text, and he props that thing up in front of me, and the the first thing I said to him is that you can't prove that the thief on the cross was not baptized because all Judea and Jerusalem went out to John to be baptized of him, number one. Only the Pharisees uh, were, ex had exempted themselves in that. The number one thing. Number two, you're not the thief. And then I told him my Diane Johnson story of this young woman, 26 years old, who died before she could be baptized. And I told him, I said, not only are you not the thief on the cross, but you're not her. And that little girl wanted it more than anything. But you're telling me that you're not going to do it because you don't want to? Because you don't think you have to? Anyway, okay. Foolish question. Great, great question. Foolish question. Ever learning to no end. Never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, I want to look at these. Put them in a list that you can read. You have a hard time reading them. Uh, the way we had them. But let's, let's kind of go around the room a little bit. Get your Bibles out. Somebody get your Bibles out. Here. Uh, my favorite verse, I'm going to do number one. Uh, and uh, Bill Thompson, you're going to do Matthew 15, 9. David Stoll, if you'd do 2 Timothy 3, 6 through 8. And there's actually two with that verse. Um, and... Uh, Kevin, you want to do one? Is it Kevin? You want to do one? Do uh, 2 Timothy 2.14 for me, if you don't mind. Uh, Philip, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and 4. Y'all have to remember these. I don't remember who I gave them to, so you're going to do them in order. Um, over here, brother, um, I forget your name, doctor. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Uh, all right, now that's, uh, Kirk, you got yours here. Do uh, Galatians 5.26. Uh, Alex, uh, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And that should, that should cover us. And you notice that I didn't do any women. Um, I didn't know which ones were comfortable with being asked, so I skipped you. I skipped all of you. I'm sorry. I don't have any kind of agenda, I promise, especially in light of my subject. Listen to this. This was one of... Lewis found it, Lewis Garrett, who was here for many years, he found it uh, uh, amusing that this was one of my favorite verses. Listen to this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. That's what Jim L. said a minute ago. God has given me what I need. And in areas where he's not revealed himself, I'm comfortable to both remain silent and for my faith to simply rest in Him in that. And you're going to encounter things. We, we all encounter things in our life that, it's, that are unrevealed. 
I think this is part of God's big picture, as you'll see, is relying on Him. All right, uh, Matthew 15, verse 9, Bill. The Lord there, he's talking about washing, he's talking about ceremonial washings in that context. That's what he's talking about. And here's what had happened under the law of Moses. The religious teachers had handed down a series of oral traditions. And those oral traditions basically were explanations about how to obey God. And, and basically what happened is their oral traditions became kind of a hedgerow around the law. As long as you don't cross the hedgerow, you're obeying God. But what happened was the hedgerow became the law. And Jesus bringing them up short about teaching the doctrines, or for doctrine, for teaching the commandments of men. And, and so all these questions that come up that are matters of, a lot of times, they're matters of opinion, they're matters of discretion, their, their areas of liberty that, that are allowed have become for some because of being wedded to their tradition have become law. And that's a, a real, and we miss, we miss God's big picture when we do that. So, all right, uh, 2 Timothy 3. Um, let's see. That's, that's Davis. And all right, so... Study to know profit, and then ever learning to know in. All right, the, that's what the two we're going to do. All right. Now, he's talking about kind of a, an interesting subject there. He's having a discussion about um, the church's care of certain saints among them. And he introduces here a potential problem with uh, the feminine gender, in this particular context at least, not remaining busy. Idle minds, the devil's workshop. That's another one of those idioms that we've practiced and, or that we've, we've lived by. And, and he takes that and he makes an application here of a, a group of people, forget the gender for a minute, who are um, happy to open the book, but there's just really no real benefit in it. And then the corrupt minds that he exercises from Old Testament history and brings forward shows them, those who oppose Moses, who was God appointed. But their corrupt minds would not let them really see God's big picture. All right, uh, 2 Timothy 2.14, same sort of uh, passage. Kevin, all right. Remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to throw about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Now listen to this. This is the potential problem. The downside is that we get all wrapped up in our quarrels, and guess what? We've poured over the midnight oil on it, haven't we, Jim? We've really spent some time studying that. And this brother over here has been studying it. And here we are locking heads with each other and what's happening in the meantime. We lose our hearers and then we drive them away from the Lord. The real downside in it. You miss our real work. God's big picture. All right, so 1 Corinthians 3. Here are some guys or in a family in the Corinthian church who had become uh, converts <laughs> to the Lord so much as they worked to different men. And their car what does carnality mean? What does carnal mean? What's, a, what's one word starts with an F, one word to just define it? Flesh, yeah, of the flesh. Thinking like men do, not spiritually minded. And Paul's contrasting that in this text uh, and, uh, and and they're missing the truth aren't they they're missing the big picture all right we got to hurry uh 
2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24. Who did I give that to? Oh. Okay, okay, thank you. Pick it up. There you go. Are you still are you seeing the pattern developing here of the conflict? It becomes a distraction and a diversion in the family. All right, second Second Corinthians two nine. Uh, First Corinthians. I'm sorry. The guy who says I know, he don't know nothing. That forgive my poor English, um, because it's not in the heart of man to imagine the things God has prepared for him. Now he goes on to say he's revealed those things to us, you see, in that context. And that God has revealed his mind to us. And we can't read God's mind. That's why whittling on God's end of the sticks is a real poor habit to get into. All right, let uh, for, uh, Galatians 5.26, I, I gave these out, so I want to read all of them. Become conceited. All right, and uh, now Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, last one. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, but you have done it all here. So by this time, you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the world of God. He has come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who takes only up the milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, but he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of If we're not properly growing in our faith, we're not going to be prepared for God's big picture. on this. So we can't see the forest for the trees. Now on the other side of that, on the other side of that, on the other side of that forest, the beauty of what God's doing is it? God's eternal plan. Before the foundation of the world, he, he began to develop his plan Galatians excuse me Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 God's story of love the Bible is is filled with little little golden threads that are woven from the beginning all the way to the end and there are all of these little sub themes that are running through it it not just the to the cross in both directions you know everything in the Old Testament is pointing toward it everything in the New Testament is pointing back to it there's so much more. The story of God's love, His love for Adam and Eve, His story for the love for the souls of men, His plan to redeem man. God's story of love. The, the story of, of the ruinous nature of sin and the forgiveness that's available. What was the, what was the real motivator when we obeyed the gospel? When we, we realized we were in our sins and lost and doomed. And then there's the promise of forgiveness. That, that, I believe, is the essence of what was missing in the, the letter to the church at Ephesus in the Revelation. You've left your first love. They've forgotten what God had done for them. Uh, and we're no longer living in accord with that. The story of human redemption. Here is everything God was doing was was headed toward the, the crucifixion, the redemptive work of Jesus, and everything afterward is dependent upon it. The story of human redemption. The story of heaven. The Genesis record uh, and the revelation, if you look at them, the, the, and Hill mentioned this, the, the loss of access to the tree of life or paradise and the paradise of God. And the restoration of that in the, in the Genesis record. Here's this theme that runs all the way through God's plan. The big picture. The doom that looms for those that are unprepared to meet God. Now, we could present a thousand of these, couldn't we? And we, we wouldn't do justice to God's big picture. But we get all wrapped up in these other things and in ourselves. We miss that. Sunday morning, before we took the Lord's Supper, um... We, uh, we sang this song. There is a green hill far away without a city wall 
where our dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us. He hung and suffered there. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved, and we must love him too. Trust in his redeeming blood and try his works to do. Here's what Paul said. Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What he's saying is I refuse. And he's writing this in that book where he's dealing with all of these issues. I, I'm de I was determined to not lose sight of God's big picture among you. And that's, that has to be our determination. I think that that mindset will change the way we deal with each other and we deal with biblical questions. We will study those words. We will burn the midnight oil in those questions. We will do that. But we will never, never, never lose sight of God's big picture and what he's trying to do among his people uh, and for the world. And if we'll be true to that, if we'll be true to that, then I think we'll be more effective. And I appreciate your spirit and attitude in, in that. Thank you so much. I was going to lead that song and I chickened out. Number 518 is going to be our invitation song. Mel is going to lead that. And Kirk Hatcher is going to lead our closing prayer in just a minute. I want to read some more from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's where we ended tonight. And I, when I came to you, brothers did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And being a very poor student in English and with a very poor vocabulary as uh, a boy, I, uh, I've always had a little bit of a, oh, what, how should I say, just a little bit of a self-esteem issue when it comes to that. And so I've spent a, a lot of time not practicing the flow of words, but learning about words and trying to add new words to my vocabulary. Whether or not I 
have ever or will ever succeed at that. I'll work at it until I, I'm not able to work at it anymore. I don't know what it was about Paul. There are some who believe that he had developed some impediment of speech that might have pertained to uh, injuries he sustained when he was stoned uh, in his second preaching trip. Uh, I don't know whether that would be a, an accurate uh, description of a possibly the first preaching trip, not whether or not that would be an accurate assessment of what it was. Uh, but I'm not even sure that's what Paul is talking about here. I've read a lot of Paul's speeches, and you have too, and they're pretty eloquent. I know they're translated out of, uh, out of Greek into English, but they're pretty eloquent. And I know that the words that were his were the words that God gave him. And so I'm not really sure that I'm buying that whole idea that that's what he has in mind here. What Paul is actually saying is that the foundational truths that are going to lead to our relationship with God do not start or finish with man. They don't. And so Paul made a determination here. He was going to come with the most crucial information necessary when he came to any church. And he described that here to the Corinthians when he came to the Corinthian church. And it's this. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why is that critical information? Why is that the most crucial? Well, think about that for just a moment. God, condescending to the state of His creation with a purpose. That affirms that Jesus of Nazareth is God. That He's the Son of God. That He is God incarnate. Now, in the Greek culture, that was an impossibility. Ha <laughs> ha. A posture that a god would take a human form, and yet all of their gods had human forms. That's an interesting observation, I suppose. Um, and yet they didn't believe that divine identity could uh, come in contact with flesh, that there was a, an aversion to that, and the possibility of that was an impossibility. And... And so they rejected it. And so they saw Jesus, the Greek world, they saw Jesus, the affirmation that he was the Son of God is, uh, is just a, a silly sort of notion, an impossible sort of notion, but keep going. Paul says, him crucified. That God would come in the form of his creation and then die. Now, the human form of Jesus died his immortal form just like yours is going to live on eternally but jesus jesus succumbed didn't he on a on a cross of his crucifixion and again that seemed like a, a just a travesty to even make a suggestion that uh, that the creation would actually be able to to take power over and to to kill a, a deity of any any form and yet in fact that's what Paul came and he preached. To what end? If you keep reading, Paul says, I was with you in weakness, fear, much trembling. It shows his, uh, his demeanor among them. It, this, was a, this was a weighty matter. Have you ever done that? You walked into a critical room. Maybe, maybe Jim did that a time or two in Washington when he sat down with the right people and he just had a few butterflies in his stomach was what he was about to have to say. Will, same thing. Several of you. Have ever been there, Ed? <laughs> in that having that conversation? Yeah. Paul said, But my speech were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, his ultimate end was to produce faith in God, not faith in him, not faith in his words, not confidence in him as a person. He was never drawing attention to himself, but their faith must rest in God. Now, the end of that story, the other side uh, of that story, the necessary conclusion of that story is that 
Jesus of Nazareth, who came and was crucified, did not stay dead in the tomb. But he was raised from the dead with power. And their faith is in a living, a resurrected Christ. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, you've not been obedient to the gospel of the Lord. Or maybe you're not even acquainted with this. Apart from God, at the consummation of all things, you're, you're lost. All of us would be, were it not for this work that Christ did. And he came and he was crucified. He bore our sins on the tree. He took to himself our sins. And Paul's going to later argue all of those points. And he did so so that we uh, could become a new creation in Christ and could be raised with power just as he was raised with power. And we can be united with him in fellowship again on the other side of our sins. And that as his children, we have the ability to look back to those events and to trust in and count on the forgiveness of our sins anew. So why would you delay? Why would any Corinthian, uh, any Corinthian person who was presented with these truths delay? Knowing that the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead had the power to reanimate them spiritually and give them restored fellowship with God. If you want to know what, looks, what that looks like, you go back and you read the early verses of the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve in the garden paradise had daily fellowship with God. If you could imagine that for yourself, then imagine that that's what God was trying to bring us back to. That was the kind of relationship He wanted to restore. And all of the ugliness in the, that, that's gone on in our lives that separated us from God in the first place could be covered over, forgiven, as though it never occurred. And that fellowship can be restored. That relationship, that family could be reunited well that's a pretty beautiful story and it's a very appealing story and it's the story of the love of god it's the story of god's eternal plan it's the story of god's redemption It's the story of sin and forgiveness it's the story of of heaven and hell it's god's big picture and that's what paul wanted them to know and so tonight we would invite you to come and to be a part of god's big picture and god's uh, will for you if you would come and respond uh, in obedience to his will. While together we stand. While we stand. Father, we come humbly before you, knowing that you are all-powerful, that you're creator of all things, and yet you regard us as your children. 
We thank you for everything that you do for us every day. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for giving us what we need. We know that you know our needs before we ask. We thank you for this group, for this family of your people. Thank you for this time that we have to spend together to worship you, study your word, to be edified and encouraged by one another. We ask you to would be with those of this family who need your special blessings. We know that Ron and Phyllis Harmon are going through very difficult times. We ask that you please be with them. And Lord, I know there are others. Father, we ask you to continue to be with us as we go. And we ask you to forgive us for our sins. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen.